ECDC On Air, the podcast of the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Keeping up to date with European epidemiology. Welcome to today's episode of ECDC On Air, which is the podcast for the European Centre for Disease Prevention and Control. Today I have with me in the studio Eva Broberg, who is a microbiologist and one of ECDC's principal experts on respiratory viruses. Eva is here to tell us more about RSV, which is a virus that may not be as familiar to many people as other respiratory viruses, such as COVID or flu. Nonetheless, it's a virus that can be serious, especially for certain risk groups. So Eva, welcome to the studio here. Thank you for having me. Can you start off a bit by telling us the basics of RSV? What are the symptoms and how does it spread? So RSV is one of the respiratory viruses. It's called respiratory syncytial virus. It causes um, mostly common cold type symptoms, but it can cause also very severe conditions for elderly or for infants, for newborns. It can be rather severe and it can cause bronchiolitis or pneumonia. It can even cause death. But of course, in Europe, we have very good health care. So the mortality is higher for RSV in low-income countries. In Europe, we have a lot of supportive care, and uh, most of the cases are saved. But uh, of course, the lower respiratory infections uh, can become very severe, and the patient could end up in, in intensive care and might need mechanical uh, ventilation, for example, and uh, RSV can cause death. And is there a treatment for it? There isn't really a treatment for RSV, so most of the treatment is supportive care. But there are a couple of prophylactic drugs that can be used for RSV, especially for the newborns. And uh, there are two products at the moment in Europe that are approved for use, and uh, those are monoclonal antibodies. It's an antibody uh, that is produced outside of the body and then administered as an injection. So similar to having a flu jab, for example. And this can be given to the newborns very early on after the birth. It can protect for the whole upcoming season of RSV. It's a product that can bind to the virus so that the virus cannot infect the cells. Is this a seasonal virus? Because we have flu always coming in the autumn. I guess with COVID, we are still yet to learn a little bit more about the seasonality. Do we know anything about the seasonality for RSV? Yes, RSV is actually a very seasonal virus, especially here in the north. So in temperate countries, uh, both in South and uh, Northern Hemisphere, it is seasonal. In the tropical areas, RSV circulates throughout the year and the epidemics are not as defined as in the Southern and, and Northern Hemisphere. Is that because people tend to be more indoors in, in colder climates? Exactly. So the epidemics are similar to influenza, where we have a very defined uh, season. So uh, during the colder months, when people are more closer together in uh, indoor spaces, we tend to see more of these uh, epidemics. So you mentioned monoclonal antibodies, but I also hear that there is uh, now on the market a new vaccine for RSV. It is correct. And there are actually three products uh, at the moment approved in Europe. And they are meant uh, for a little bit different populations. So uh, two of those are targeting elderly people and uh, different countries are starting to implement these uh, vaccines in their vaccination schemes. Then there are also maternal vaccinations, which are meant to be for pregnant women. And then the antibodies produced in the pregnant women will be transferred to the fetus. And uh, with that uh, the the meaning is to protect the newborn. So it is not really to protect the mother, but uh, really to protect the newborn. And uh, this vaccine, is it available now across Europe or just in a few countries? Two of these products have come to the market only last year. And the third one has been approved now in August uh, 2024. Not all countries have yet taken them into use and had the opportunity to implement them in the national vaccination schemes. 
Many countries are looking into the possibility. They're making cost-benefit analysis for these vaccines. And then I'm sure that slowly we will see more implementation of these vaccines in Europe. So now when we know a little bit more about what RSV is and how you can prevent it, what would you say, what's the best things one can do if you're, let's say, a concerned mother or if you want to protect yourself, what should you do? So it is very similar to what people have learned now during COVID pandemic. As RSV spreads through respiratory route, through uh, droplets, so it's mostly through coughing and sneezing and touching surfaces uh, that might have been infected that RSV transmits. It's very similar to protect yourself as for COVID. So it is about good cuffing uh, hygiene, cuffing to the sleeve rather than, than to your hands. It's protecting your near ones uh, when you are sick yourself, so not to have close contact with people who are sick or infected, and uh, staying at home when you are sick. How do you distinguish between RSV and uh, other viruses? It's not easy. So you would need a laboratory test uh, to distinguish from influenza and SARS-CoV-2, for example, or other respiratory viruses. The pediatricians are very good at learning how an RSV cuff sounds. Uh, So the ones who are seeing a lot of uh, these bronchiolitis babies who have um, RSV infection, they tend to learn to know. So you would really need a laboratory test to to know for sure that it's an RSV infection. Does it pose a big strain on healthcare services every year? It can cause a very high impact on the healthcare. Uh, So as during the peak weeks of the season, there can be a lot of babies that end up in pediatric wards and also in the ICU, so even in intensive care or who need additional oxygen. So it does uh, cause a a strain on healthcare. One thing that I've noticed is that RSV nowadays, you hear about that a lot more than you used to just a few years ago. I mean, I, I was quite unfamiliar with RSV, but it seems like it's something that's been around for quite a long time. And uh, and yet uh, it's only in the last few years that it's been starting to be mentioned in media and so on. Can you explain why is that? Uh, so sure, RSV has been around for a long time. And even at the CDC, we've collected data for RSV. Uh, many years already. So it's a known phenomenon and it's a known virus for everyone who works in the respiratory field. Why it it has become maybe more known is that now that there are new vaccines that have come to the market uh, since last year and also this new monoclonal antibody that is now available and that one is a kind of a game changer and also the vaccines, of course, because now this new monoclonal, you don't need to inject many times during the season for the babies, only once before the season. And so it's maybe easier to administer and people are more interested. And also now that we have vaccines available for elderly and also this maternal vaccination, it starts to be available to people and people not want to know about this, that okay, and of course, also public health experts want to give advice and uh, guidance on the topic to people to take the vaccine when it comes available in your own country. So what is the burden? Uh, how many people are affected each year? So every year, approximately 30 million episodes of respiratory sensitial virus infection are recorded globally. And about 60,000 childhood deaths are due to RSV. This is worldwide. And as I mentioned earlier, the highest burden of RSV is in the low income countries. But here, even in Europe, in high income settings, RSV is responsible for about fifth of the acute respiratory infection hospitalizations every year. So those are high numbers. We know from a study done in in Europe, one in 56 healthy term born infants are hospitalized due to RSV. These are not somehow high risk babies. These are just normal babies born and one in 56 births are hospitalized due to RSV. And this is quite a high burden. And then if we look in elderly also, about 5 to 10% of nursing home residents in Europe can have RSV-caused pneumonia due to RSV every season. 
So this is also a very high burden. And even of the community acquired pneumonias, two to five percent of those are due to RSV. And still, if I can mention one more number, there has been a study in in Europe, in the EU countries, among the 18 years old or above, so in adult population. So in total, we have about 160,000 hospitalizations due to RSV on a yearly basis. And does this include normal, otherwise healthy people that are not in a risk group? Yes. These are just people above 18 years old. But of course, based on this study also, we know that the majority of those are in the elderly. So this is an adult population study. And based on this, we know that more than 90% of those cases are in 65 years old or older. So for us uh, who are more sort of uh, middle-aged, do we need to take any precautions to prevent ourselves from uh, getting infected or...? I don't think we necessarily need to worry if we are not in a particular risk group, like being immunocompromised or having a lung or heart disease. Those are also adult risk uh, factors for RSV, a severe infection. But of course, we need to take care of others who are in risk. So we need to take care of our infant population. So uh, maybe a a neighbor of yours has a a newborn or your parents uh, might have um, risk factors or are in age group uh, 65 and and older. So they are, of course, in great risk of severe infection due to RSV. Therefore, it's uh, good practice for us in the adult population, even if not being in a particular risk for a severe infection to protect others who might be in risk. You mentioned before that in the tropics, RSV circulates throughout the year. There's not so much of a seasonality. Do we see any variations across the EU? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've studied this myself a little bit with the data that we have available. There is a certain gradient from south to north. So we tend to see uh, longer seasons of RSV in the north of EU countries And also the peak of RSV seasons comes a little bit later in the north than in the south of EU. Is there any particular country where I should be thinking that, you know, I should take uh, more precautions or different precautions or is it the same across the EU? It is the same because the RSV seasons are seen everywhere in Europe and it's just a, a matter of a couple of weeks difference when the season starts or when it peaks. So we have roughly 16 weeks of RSV circulation in the EU countries and the peak tends to come around New Year or or a little bit later. And then the influenza season follows very tightly after the, the RSV season. And do we have data? How has it evolved throughout the years? Is it do we see the same numbers or is there a rise? So before COVID pandemic, we tended to see very similar seasons in terms of the timing and in terms of the impact of the RSV seasons. Then came COVID pandemic and we saw absolutely nothing. So like influenza also and many other infectious diseases with the lockdowns and with less social contacts between people, RSV epidemics died, basically. And there was no no detectable circulation of, of RSV infections in the population. After that, uh, RSV seasons have started uh, coming again, and they are more and more coming to their kind of old place in terms of the timing of the season. Two years ago in 2022, we saw a very severe RSV season in Europe. And many countries had their healthcare very much strained during that period. Was that because a lot of people had not been exposed to the virus before and that there was a a kind of a reservoir? I mean, I think we've seen that with other diseases Mm -hmm. as well. Yeah, yeah, I think uh, it's exactly that, that during COVID pandemic, when there was very little circulation of RSV, the newborns and the children didn't get uh, infected with RSV. And now that the seasons have returned and there is more circulation, more transmission of RSV again in the population, then it hit kind of hard on the community. So I know that you work a lot with uh, surveillance uh, here at ECDC. I have a question regarding that because I understand some diseases are what we call notifiable diseases. So it's mandatory for 
member states to report these cases. RSV, I understand it's still not a notifiable disease. Is that correct? It is not at EU level. Some countries have made it notifiable already some years back. One example is Ireland. We have been working towards making RSV notifiable. It's not yet quite through the whole European Commission's process but it's likely to become a notifiable disease in the few coming years. And uh, how is that going to change the work that ECDC does? Is it going to be easier for us to spot trends? Will it change, you think, any sort of uh, guidelines or recommendations that we give? So we have already started working with RSV in, in such a way that it is integrated into our other respiratory viruses surveillance, so together with influenza and uh, SARS-CoV-2. But when RSV becomes notifiable, it becomes as a mandatory reporting for all the member states. So we uh, expect that more countries will then start reporting on RSV. We have already now about two thirds of the country, so roughly 20 countries who report RSV data to us on a weekly basis, but that's voluntary. But when RSV becomes notifiable at EU level, then all countries should start reporting RSV. And then, of course, we we will have a better geographic understanding of how the RSV seasons occur. Can you tell me a little bit more about your role as principal expert? You have a background as a microbiologist, I understand. What is it that you do and how does that fit in with ECDC's work on RSV? So my background is in virology. So I've been working as a researcher earlier before coming to ECDC. And here at ECDC, I'm very much involved in basically three topics. One of those is coordinating the respiratory viruses laboratory network and also some technical support for the laboratory network. And then surveillance, that is one of the work areas where I'm active. And then also scientific advice, guidance, risk assessments, also scientific reports. And in particular, what's ECDC doing in terms of RSV? We collect surveillance data. So basically how many detections of RSV have been seen in the countries on a weekly basis. So countries can submit those data to our, uh, the European uh, surveillance system, TESI. And then we publish those data also on a weekly basis. And that we do in a technical bulletin called Irvis, Irvis Irvis.org. You can find that online and you can play with those data on your own. And it's quite nice tool to see the RSV seasons also there. You can filter also for your own country. And so uh, there we show the data that we collect. But we also collect, of course, data on how the countries are taking the new vaccines and drugs into use. And I have colleagues who are keeping an eye on the implementation of the developments in the countries. And then if there is any unusual situation with RSV, we might receive a signal through our epidemic intelligence services. And if we assess that there is a need or a country asks us for that, we might do a risk assessment, for example, like we did in autumn of 22, when there was a very severe situation with RSV. I have one last question for you. Are there any future developments in the field of RSV that you're excited about? There are. So I'm very excited of the current era, so to say, for RSV, because this is really a new moment where we have Uh, these new vaccines coming to the market. And there are also these new monoclonal antibodies. And there is a bunch of other drugs and vaccine development ongoing. And uh, hopefully we will see many more products that will give a good effectiveness uh, against RSV. And also we hope to see, and we are interestingly uh, following the developments in the member states that how they will Uh, take these products into use. And of course, with those, we then are hoping to see a decrease in the RSV burden in the member states. So less hospitalizations, less uh, impact on the healthcare systems and uh, many more uh, saved lives. Let's hope that that will be the case. Yeah, because I understand it's uh, even though it's, it's a lesser known disease, it's something that we should not be ignoring. Absolutely. So thank you, Eva. Yeah, that's uh, all the questions I have for you today. Uh, thanks for being with us here on ECDC On Air. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed this episode of ECDC On Air. For more information about ECDC and its work, please visit us on the web at ecdc.europa.eu or follow us on social media.